Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got some people joining us already, um, but I'll give it a few minutes um, before we get started properly. Welcome to those who are uh, just joining. Um, still got people, uh, well, I was gonna say trickling in, but flocking in at the moment. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll give it a couple of minutes while people are joining and then, uh, then get started. Okay, I think we're a, we're a couple of minutes past half past now, so uh, hopefully most people have, uh, have been able to join. Um, so yeah, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar, uh, Microplastics from Source to Sea, um, hosted by SIWEM's Central Southern Branch. Uh, I'm Lewis Perbrick. I work for the Environment Agency in Thames area, uh, and I'm also a member of the uh, Central Southern Branch. Um, I also sit on the uh, Environment Agency Thames Area Plastics Group. Um, before I introduce this afternoon's uh, speaker, um, just want to go through a, a few notices. Um, so firstly, a reminder that this is a uh, one in a whole series of events and talks hosted by uh, SIWEM um, over the course of the year. So uh, please do visit the SIWEM website uh, to find details of all of the, the events uh, and also to see recordings uh, from, from past events as well. Um, there are uh, too many uh, events coming up to mention them all, but just to, uh, to pick out a couple that are coming up in the, in the near future. Um, we've got a talk coming up on the 13th of September uh, in relation to biodiversity net gain, and that's being hosted by our Northwest and uh, North Wales branch, um, but it's open to, uh, to all uh, members and non-members alike. Um, and also a reminder of the uh, SIWEM Central Southern Branch AGM, uh, which is coming up on the 24th of September. So uh, just to note the change of date for that one, um, that's now on the, on the 24th of September. Uh, also, if you go onto the uh, website, you'll find details of uh, how SIWEM are responding and uh, getting involved with uh, both our de declared uh, climate emergency and also the upcoming uh, COP26, which is, of course, being hosted in Glasgow later in the year. Um, and finally, just to give a plug to um, uh, World Rivers Day, um, which is on the 26th of September this year. So lots of activities and talks going on in relation to World Rivers Day. Um, so again, if you visit their website, um, 
you'll um, please do have a look, see if there's anything there that takes your interest or better still that you can uh, get involved with. Don't worry about um, jotting all of that down. Um, Barbara is supporting us today with the technology and she'll be dropping links in uh, to, to all of those uh, events and websites that I've just mentioned. So um, on to the main part of uh, today's session. Um, just to um, uh, come up with a, to, uh, put a couple of reminders out there. If you have any uh, technical issues, um, please drop that into the, the chat. As I say, we've got Barbara on hand and she will do her best to resolve any technical issues you're having with Zoom. Um, if you've got any questions, um, then during the session, then please put those into the question and answer section uh, on Zoom. So use the question and answer tool to pose your, pose your questions. Um, I'll assume most of those questions are gonna be for our speaker, Alice, this afternoon. Um, but equally, if you've got any questions for me, um, just mark those uh, and then we will, we will pick those up. Um, the intention is to pick up the, the questions at the end, but uh, please do post them as we go through. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll do our best to answer those at the end of the session. So yeah, please put those into the question and answer session, uh, section uh, rather than the, uh, the chat section. Okay. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, present this afternoon's speaker, uh, Dr. Alice Horton. Um, Alice is a um, principal investigator at the National Oceanography Centre. Um, she's a leading expert on microplastics um, and especially their interaction with um, organisms within the aquatic environment. Um, she's published a number of papers on the subject and she also sits on uh, the SIWEM advisory panel. Um, she also heads up the UK Microplastic Network, um, linking research in with business, um, policy and uh, industry. I'm really looking forward to this one. So um, I'm very pleased to hand over to Alice uh, to give, her, give us her perspective on uh, microplastics from source to sea. Great. Uh, thank you, Lewis, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me here to speak today to this uh, SIWEM webinar. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of some of the research that I've been doing over recent years and how this really links uh, microplastics from where they begin to where they end up within the environment and what happens to them along the way. Obviously, this is a really huge topic, so I won't be able to cover it in great detail. Um, but if, they, if you've got any questions about anything that I discuss or you want a bit more information as we go through, then do feel free to answer or ask those questions at the end. So if we start with looking at plastic production, I'm sure you're all very well aware of plastics and its use today um, and the fact that plastic production is exponentially increasing and has really been doing since around the 1950s when plastics first became commercially available. We're just using more and more and more to the point where nowadays we're producing around 350 million tonnes of plastic every year. Now, we know, of course, a lot of this plastic is really essential. And actually, nowadays, we couldn't really do without plastics in our daily lives, from medical applications to technology to transport and so on. But of course, we know as well that a lot of plastics are not managed in the correct manner. So we end up with images like this, whereby you get people trying to do the right thing. A lot of the time, putting rubbish in the bin, they think it's going to go to the right place. But in fact, you get one gust of wind or something ends up in the wrong place and it all just gets up distributed within the environment. And we see this with a lot of plastics that we use day to day, especially things that are very prominent and prevalent like single use packaging, plastic bags, plastic bottles and so on. So we know that there's an issue of plastic being distributed within the environment. What's really important to note, though, when we're talking about plastics is that plastics are not just one thing. So we can't say plastics do this or plastics do that, plastics are bad, plastics are good, because they're all really completely different. So we're looking at multiple different types of polymers, different shapes. So we've got um, plastic bottles, plastic bags, you know, you know the drill, um, lots of different sizes. So we have macro plastics, which are large plastic items, all the way down to micro plastics, which I'll elaborate on in a minute. We know that plastics are all manufactured with different types of additives in, 
So even if you get one type of polymer, for example, PVC that's used for window frames might have very different additives to PVC that's used for a completely different purpose. So it's not necessarily just the, poly the polymer type, but the chemicals are added to it. And all of these things will influence the behavior of the item. So where it will go, whether it will float or sink, how it degrades and so on. So it's really important for us to try and pick these things apart when we're trying to understand plastics as a contaminant within the environment. As we're focusing on microplastics, just to highlight some of this diversity, we have lots of different shapes here, for example. So we've got beads or pellets, uh, also known as nurdles. So these are the pre-production pellets that people uh, would melt down to then form large plastic items. We've got microfibers that are shed from textiles. We've got fragments that are broken down from larger items. And this is just a, a snapshot. There are obviously lots of more different types of, of fibers, of fragments, of pellets, and different shapes that can be found here. Broadly, microplastics are categorized as either primary or secondary. So primary microplastics are those that are specifically designed to be microscopic or of a very small size. So these uh, nurdles or beads, for example, um, cosmetic microbeads, sandblasting beads, glitter, and so on. Secondary microplastics are those that have formed unintentionally as a result of the use of their parent item. So whether that's fibers shed from textiles while they're in use or while they're being laundered, or whether it's fragments shed from larger items while they're being used or once they reach the environment and start to break down. So what I wanted to do as well is to really define microplastics because there are lots of people talking about microplastics and there are also lots of different definitions. So in general, this is the definition that I tend to adhere to. And this was also the one that was set out recently by the European Chemicals Agency, ECHA. Um, so the uh, definition of a microplastic is a solid polymer particle. It's less than five millimeters in size. It's insoluble in water and it's very resistant to biodegradation or degradation in general. Now, where we have this kind of discrepancy maybe is in the lower size range. So where micro becomes nano, most people uh, generally would accept that this is anything that's less than one micron. So um, that would be a, a good definition to go on. Some people would say that it's 100 nanometers, which is the same as the definition of an engineered nanoparticle is less than 100 nanometers. But I think for now, we'll just stick with less than one micron. It's kind of easier to choose one and stick with it. So in terms of where microplastics come from, I think, you know, people are aware of a lot of these sources. Um, I've mentioned already that the beads, we've got glitter and cosmetic microbeads. One thing um, to note is that although microbeads in wash off cosmetics were banned in around 2017, and I think a lot of people are aware of this. In fact, microbeads are still used in a lot of products um, that such as those are designed not to be washed off the skin and left on. So for example, a lot of sunscreens will have microbeads or nanoplastics within them. Also things like household cleaning products, laundry detergents and so on can contain microplastics and those haven't yet been banned. So they can still get into the environment. We've got the fibers that I mentioned and also fragments of things that break down. So this actually uh, used to be a plastic bag. This, this orange thing in the top right corner, would you believe, um, has become very brittle and degraded over time and to the point that it just disintegrates. And then we also have things like dust that comes from construction sites. So if people are drilling or sawing plastic, for example, of course, this will create lots of plastic particles. So again, these are just a few examples of where microplastics might derive from. So what's interesting when we're talking about microplastics is really to think about where they're going and where they're coming from. Um, there's a lot of talk, of course, about plastics in the oceans, which is really important. But this diagram that was uh, produced by the IUCN uh, in 2017 really shows that actually the ocean is not necessarily the only point that we should be focusing on. If you look on the right hand side here, you can see that actually around 48% of plastics that enter the environment will end up within the ocean. In fact, around 52% will either be retained on land, within soils, potentially within rivers, um, and so on. So actually, there's quite a, a, quite a split between oceans and the, and the land. We also know, of course, that actually the majority of plastic is derived from land. So it's where we use plastic, it's where we as humans, of course, live, where we manufacture it. Uh, so this um, report estimated that around 98% of microplastics that enter the environment are land derived. 
only around 2% are um, originating in the ocean itself. So whether that's being dumped directly from ships as a result of fishing gear that's put directly into the sea and so on. So actually, we really need to be focusing on these land-based sources if we want to try and uh, reduce and eliminate plastic release into the environment. If we look at this in a bit more of a, a sort of complex way, in a bit more detail, this diagram gives an overview of the ways in which microplastics can travel throughout the environment, but also where they might end up. So these orange boxes represent sinks. So we have things like soils, uh, lake and river sediments, even water can act as a sink depending on the direction of the flow. And of course, we have this ultimate sink that people often think of, which is the ocean. But what's important from looking at this diagram is really the diversity in the places from which microplastics can derive, where they can end up, but also that they don't necessarily reach one place and stay there. So there can be this sort of cycle of plastics moving around whereby they, for example, enter a river and then during flooding get deposited back onto land. So it's not necessarily the case that a sink is a permanent sink. It could be a temporary sink, depending on lots of local uh, environmental conditions, seasonality, uh, weather conditions, and so on. So all of this is really important to think about if we want to try and understand where plastic is going. It's not just that it derives on land, it enters the river, flows into the sea, and that's where it stays forever. It's, it's more complex than that. So if we, we kind of take this view of land to river to sea, that's sort of the, the story that I'm going to go through, just bearing in mind, of course, that there are different ways in which microplastics might go back upstream. But if we're looking at land to start with, it's, it's fair to say that there have been very few studies of quantified plastics within the terrestrial environment. This is obviously quite surprising because we know that land is obviously very contaminated with plastic. All you have to do is go to a local park, go to the you know, supermarket, go to the town or whatever, you'll see plastic on the floor everywhere. Um, as per this picture on the right hand side, we know, of course, that plastics are used a lot in agriculture. So if we're thinking about soil that's used for crops, then this is potentially a place where plastics can accumulate. We also know that microfibers especially can enter the terrestrial environment through the application of sewage sludge. And this is something that I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, when, micro, when uh, wastewater treatment plants remove microplastics, they don't remove them, they end up within the sludge. Um, and then of course, whichever microplastics might end up with, uh, on the land, uh, either will be retained within the soil, but they also have the potential to run off via um, general land runoff through drainage ditches and so on. And they can enter waterways there to be um, released into rivers, potentially ultimately into the ocean. So. There is uh, a lot of kind of research that could be done on microplastics in terrestrial environments to really try and tease apart these processes. So I mentioned wastewater. Um, I'm sure some of the people here are quite au fait with wastewater treatment processes, so I'm not going to go into this in any detail. And of course, this is a very basic diagram of wastewater treatment. But we know, of course, that wastewater has multiple different treatment steps. And at any point along this treatment process, particles may be removed whether that's by skimming or whether that's by settling to the sludge and so on. The effluent then, of course, is what is released into the environment, usually into river systems. Um, but we do know that wastewater treatment processes are not necessarily 100% effective at removing microplastics from this effluent. They generally were not designed to filter out particles of, of this size that are made of plastic. That's not what wastewater systems were originally made for. Um, but considering this, actually, we do know that this process is, is effective. Um, we've seen from various studies that have been carried out, including one that I worked on for Upqueer last year, um, which was the sink to river, river to tap project, looking at flow of microplastics through a wastewater treatment plant, that actually these processes can remove more than 99% of microplastics. In fact, the study that we did found 99.9% .9 of microplastics were removed from the effluent when you compare the concentrations in the influent to what's released in the effluent. Nonetheless, um, there has been a calculation done by another author that suggested that due to the huge volumes of wastewater that are processed every day, especially via very large sewage treatment works, um, these could release millions of microplastics per day. So it's not insignificant, even if we're thinking that only 
0.1% of microplastics remain compared to what was put into the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and so I mentioned sludge as well, and this is really important to consider because if we're talking about wastewater treatment processes removing plastic, we know of course that these are not removed completely, they're not destroyed, uh, and the sludge processes don't destroy microplastics either. Um, so actually a lot of these microplastics that end up within the sludge will end up being concentrated and this sludge will often within the EU and the UK be applied to land as a soil conditioner and a soil fertilizer. So it's worth bearing in mind that even if these particles are not released to the water, to the rivers via effluent, they could still be released to land via a different route. If we're looking at ways in which things get input to rivers in general, so this is general inputs to rivers, uh, but could contribute pollutants, including microplastics. Within the UK, we have a lot of different ways in which things can enter rivers. So I've mentioned effluent already, uh, also known as grey water. This is uh, treated wastewater that is released to um, river systems. We also have CSOs, so combined sewer overflows that during periods of very high flow will release untreated wastewater into river systems. Um, so potentially another source, not just of microplastics, but of course of sewage pollution in general. We have storm drain inputs, so this is untreated road derived runoff. We've got land runoff, um, either from agricultural or from urban landscapes, drainage ditches from agricultural systems. And then, of course, if we're thinking about plastic inputs to rivers, we might just have dumping of litter in general, whether that's intentional or unintentional. So moving to rivers, when I first started researching microplastics, there had been almost nothing done on microplastics in rivers within the UK. So this seemed like an obvious place to start in terms of thinking, you know, are there microplastics present in UK rivers? And if so, where are they coming from? And what is influencing the abundance of these particles? So what I used, knowing that wastewater could be a potential source of microplastics, was um, a measure of effluent within the river at any one time. So this would be an, uh, an average effluent load at different sites to try and determine which I hypothesized would be the most contaminated sites within the River Thames Basin with microplastics. So you can see the names of the sites along the bottom of this graph here with increasing effluent load going from left to right. Now, if we look at the results, you can see interestingly that actually the site that I expected to be the most contaminated was not, it was the second most contaminated um, and vice versa. The site that I expected to be the second most contaminated was the first most contaminated. And this was quite confusing because if I was basing my expectation on wastewater being the key input of microplastics, then this then led me to question why I was really seeing so many particles at this other site. And after a bit of, of toing and froing, it came to light really that the main reason for this was the fact that this site was directly at this storm drain outfall. So where this untreated road runoff enters this river system, these particles de get deposited into the sediment are generally quite heavy because they're road derived, they're often bits of paint and so on, uh, end up being kind of sequestered within the sediment at this site. And this diagram really gives a, a better overview of why this might be. So at this site, having determined that this storm drain was the most likely source of these particles, we went upstream to look at the surrounding area, found this red treated road surface. So this is a thermoplastic road marking paint that's applied to denote a bus lane, for example. But we know, of course, that particles on the roads, they can degrade, uh, paints will break down over time. These particles end up being washed down the drain. Uh, if you've got eagle eyes, you can see that there's a lot of red particles just about to wash down this drain. So these are the paint particles that get released via this storm drain and straight into the sediment. So this image in the bottom left on the right hand side is um, the particles that I found within my sample. So at the time of finding them, it was really not clear what these were. As soon as you determine that they've come from this road surface and compare those particles, it becomes very obvious this is what they are. So this is a very direct route that shows that particles can travel from land into rivers and be retained there. Then if we're thinking about uh, the oceans, of course, we know that rivers can transport plastics, but we also know that there are a lot of direct inputs of plastics to the oceans. So this can be in the form of things like fishing gear, whether it's discarded intentionally or unintentionally, we know that it retains, um, is retained within the environment 
for a very long time because it doesn't degrade. We've got boat paints, so flakes of paint that have plastic additives or are plastic derived. We've got uh, legal or illegal dumping of waste, depending on where it's dumped and what that waste is. We've got litter again, and we've got nurdles, which we know often get lost during shipping accidents, container ships, they lose containers over the side, and we often find nurdles washing up on beaches for this reason. So there are also lots of ways in which particles can directly enter the marine system. But what we have when we're looking at the oceans is actually a bit of a conundrum because what we believe should be in the ocean is not what we can observe. And this is where it becomes really confusing because if we think about the amount of plastic that gets discarded, this is the annual average amount of plastic on the left hand side that's discarded every year into the ocean. So this is around 8 million tonnes of plastic into the ocean every year. However, if we look at the range of studies that have been carried out on plastics in the ocean, actually, when we look at what's there, we can only account for around 10% of the plastic that we believe should be there, which obviously means that 90% is unaccounted for. If we then look at these very small plastics, so these microplastic particles, then we can only account for around 1% of the plastic that we believe should be in the ocean. So this becomes really confusing because we think, well, if it's there, surely we could find it. And if it is there and we can't find it, then where is it? Why are we, are we looking in the wrong place or what's, what's the deal? So yeah, where is the last 99%? So this is something that a couple of my colleagues at the National Oceanography Centre have been looking at for the last couple of years, is really trying to find out where these particles are. So this was a study that was carried out in the Atlantic Ocean. They carried out a transect from the north to the South Atlantic, which is the uh, Atlantic Meridional Transect, which is a, a transect that's regularly analysed for various different parameters. They added microplastics to it as part of this study. You can see then on the top right, we've got this image whereby you have sampling points at the surface of the ocean with latitude. But what they also did is they collected samples at different depths. So not just looking at what's floating on the surface of the ocean, which is where a lot of people tend to focus their studies, but actually trying to determine where the plastics can be found within the subsurface layers of the ocean. So around 100 to 200 meters depth um, and whether this, how this influences is influenced by the mixed layer of the surface ocean. So just to give a, a snippet, this is only looking at one of the polymers that they detected. So this is polyethylene. Again, with the same diagram looking at um, latitude and then particles with depth, what you can see first off is that there are particles found at a variety of different depths. So even if, as we start looking down to around 250 metres depth within the ocean, we're still finding plastic particles, which is not necessarily what people expect. We know that a lot of plastics are buoyant, so they float on the surface of the ocean. This is showing that actually we really need to start considering these lower depths because we're finding plastic there. Also, it's not necessarily also the case that we find the highest concentration at the surface. So depending on where within the transect they were and what latitude they were, sometimes the concentration would be higher at the surface, sometimes it would be higher at depth. So this is a really interesting amount of data that shows that all is not necessarily what we would expect and actually plastics are a lot more widespread than we would we would maybe have thought and this as I mentioned is just for one type of polymer. So how does this compare to what we we think should be in the ocean? I, I mentioned already that we can't really account for everything that we think should be in the ocean based on what's being put in. So this now is not the annual input but the total input of these three key polymers that were found within this study. So we have polyethylene, polypropylene and polystyrene. We believe that for polyethylene, for example, around 18 million tonnes of polyethylene has been input to the ocean since the 1950s. Uh, around 12,000 of polypropylene, around three to 4,000 of polystyrene. If we then look at the data that my colleagues collected on these three polymers, we can see that actually we're finding an incredible amount more of these polymers than what we ever thought should be present within the ocean. So based on what we thought we'd put in, actually we're finding more even than that, which of course becomes a bit confusing. What you can see um, as well from these columns is that actually the majority of the plastic that was found in this study was found at greater than 200 meters depth, which really shows that if you're only focusing on the surface of the ocean, here at around zero to 200 meters. In fact, the um, masses of these polymers kind of match what you might expect. If you start looking at depth, you're really starting to see a huge amount more 
Also, what's really worth noting, and it's probably the key influencing factor in this study, is the size of particles that have been analysed. So if we look at the um, original data on what we believe has been input to the Atlantic, this is particles that are larger than 300 microns in size. So still considered to be microplastic, but missing those very small particles. If we look then at the size range that my colleagues were looking at, this goes down to 36 microns. So reasonably, um, a reasonable amount smaller. Now you might not think that this difference of you know, 250 microns really makes that much difference, but as we can see, it really does appear to make a huge difference. And this correlates with what we believe that actually in the environment, it's the very small particles that are most abundant, both in terms of number, and also now this appears to be also in terms of mass. So this really implies that we need to start focusing on these smaller particles when we're doing our surveys. So really just to sum up with that study, um, it shows that not all microplastics are floating and many are found at depth. Also the mass of microplastics in the ocean is actually greater than we expected. So I've mentioned the size of particles and that this is something that we should really focus on. Um, I wanted to highlight that there are massive challenges with this. Um, and I think anybody who's working in this field would appreciate this, um, that these very small particles are much more difficult to analyze. Um, I think it goes without saying that, you know, you can't see them. So a lot of the techniques that have been used to date, which rely on visible analysis, become defunct when you start looking at these very small particles. If we're looking at less than 10 microns, this becomes difficult, even with spectroscopic techniques like FTIR and Raman. If we want to look at these nanoscale plastics, so less than one micron, then analytical chemistry is needed to determine mass of polymers within samples. And of course, these techniques are not necessarily available to everybody and different labs have different availability, different equipment availability. So there are lots of different uh, ways in which people are doing this. This means that there are multiple methods available, but there's a lack of standardization. So everybody's doing it in a different way. And for this reason, there's also a lack of harmonization. So it means that it's quite difficult to compare data between different studies. As you saw in the last slide, if you're looking at particles greater than 300 microns compared to particles greater than 30 microns, you actually see this huge discrepancy. And that's not necessarily because there's a difference in the number of particles at different sites that were analyzed, but just that the techniques that we used were different. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that I'm not gonna dwell on this, but contamination is really a key consideration when you're doing microplastic analysis, because we know that plastics are everywhere within our homes, within our labs. Unfortunately, you know, everywhere that we go, we're going to get plastics and you're going to get contamination regardless of how hard you try to account for to reduce this so what we really need to do is make sure that we're accounting for it when we do our analysis and making sure that that doesn't get counted as particles that were found within our sample so i'm just going to move on uh, briefly to microplastics and ecological effects because of course we know that microplastics now are widespread within the environment across different environmental compartments but i'm also really interested in what this means ecologically so what does it mean for the organisms that come into contact with plastics, that ingest plastics and so on? And we know that the likelihood of ingestion of plastics and the subsequent effects of these depends on a number of different factors. So this is things like the proximity to source, so where the organism sits within the environment in general, their habitat, the behaviour and feeding habits, so the traits of the organism, and the particle types, shapes and behaviours and so on, so whether they float or whether they sink, of course, will influence the organisms that come into contact with them. So I just wanted to highlight a study that I carried out um, within the River Thames. So this was looking at the common roach and trying to determine whether, whether these common roach have ingested plastics and what other factors that influence this ingestion. So I selected a number of sites along the River Thames uh, and measured the distance downstream from the source of the river. So to try and see whether their position within the river would influence the number of particles they'd ingested, assuming that as you go down, downstream towards London, the river potentially becomes more contaminated with microplastics as it has flown through cities like Oxford and Reading, for example. So in terms of what we found, um, I think it's clear to say that particles had been ingested by the fish. So around one third of the fish that were examined had ingested at least one microplastic particle. 75% of these particles were fibrous, so microfibers, um, which correlates with a lot of other studies that have shown that 
organisms will ingest fibres primarily, potentially because they look like things like filamentous algae, for example. Um, these polymers were identified as polyethylene, polypropylene and polyester. And if you look at the actual data here, you can see that there were, as I mentioned, two thirds of fish haven't ingested any plastic. So there are a reasonable number that just had um, zero. But if we look at those that had ingested plastics and the maximum number of plastics that were likely to be ingested, we did see a, a trend with distance downstream from the river source, whereby there was potentially a higher number of plastics that could be ingested as the fish was further downstream. But we also saw differences in this ingestion based on the size of the fish. So the larger the fish, the more likely it was to have ingested plastics, which probably isn't surprising because it's likely to ingest more stuff in general. Um, and then I mentioned the, the distance from the source as well. So all of this then really leads us to the question, what's the problem? You know, we know it's everywhere. We know organisms are ingesting it. But if actually there's no environmental effect of that, then does it really matter? So. I think it, it's fair to say that there are some problems that can occur with plastics. So we've seen, of course, in the news that animals can get trapped or entangled in large pieces of plastics. You will have seen dolphins and whales and so on within the media washed up on beaches. This same thing can happen for small organisms like zooplankton and microplastics at the, at the smaller scale. This can still happen. We know that animals will accidentally eat plastics or maybe, you know, on purpose, they think it's something else. Um, this can lead to trophic chain transfer. We know that plastics last for hundreds of years. So this is one of the key problems with plastics is that we keep putting more and more into the environment, but what is already there is not going anywhere. So we're getting this massive accumulation. We know that plastics contain many chemicals that release into the environment, whether this is plasticizers, dyes, persistent organic chemicals, metals, and so on. So these can potentially be toxic in themselves. Large plastics will break down into microplastics. So one plastic bottle within the environment, for example, could create millions or billions of micro or nanoplastic particles. So potentially exacerbating the problem the longer it's been in the environment. And these microplastics are more easily eaten and can potentially accumulate within tissues, can potentially have these effects on health, such as reproduction and growth. Now I keep saying potentially because actually this depends a lot on the organism. Some organisms are quite susceptible to harm from microplastics and other pollutants. Some are very resilient and no effect will be seen whatsoever. And this depends again on the type of particle, the chemicals are added to it and so on. So it is often the case that we see that there's no effect whatsoever, that a plastic can be ingested and egested with no negative effect. But what we really need to focus on is what this means long-term, because of course we have this very kind of chronic exposure to plastics within the environment. And what does this mean? Because we've only had plastics in the environment for the last 50 years or so, which is less than a human generation. So if we're thinking about uh, into the future, a few hundred years, and we know the plastic will still be there, uh, how can we account for that? So there are many, many questions remaining, and I've only just picked out a few here just to highlight some of the things that we're really still uh, wanting to know and the key questions. So where do they accumulate? I mean, you could say, well, we already know they accumulate within the ocean, in the sediments and so on. But like I'd highlighted, there's actually a lot of plastics that we can't account for, whether it's the size of particles that we've been analysing, but also not necessarily looking in all the right places. We want to try and understand where they go. Will there be long term ecological effects? So I mentioned just now, if we see these sub lethal effects like uh, lower level population effects, will this have knock on ecosystem effects uh, longer term. How do the future pollution scenarios influence risk? So again, we know that the amount of plastic that's in the environment will only continue to increase. So what does this increased exposure mean for the ecosystems that are in the presence of microplastics going into the future? And then finally, how can we mitigate? And I think this is almost one of the most challenging questions to address is what should we be doing at this point in time to try and reduce this problem? Because what's in the environment, you know, it can't be removed. You can remove small pieces of it and that's great, but we actually won't be able to get rid of it, everything that's there. So where should we be looking within this chain, uh, this consumer chain, this industry chain, this manufacturing chain to really try and drill down to this problem and how we can prevent it? So I hope I've uh, raised more questions than you may have had before. Um, and I hope you enjoyed listening and I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you.
Thank you, Alice. That was, um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, really interesting presentation um, that I think really neatly covered everything from uh, an overview to the uh, of the sources of microplastics right through to some uh, some really quite cutting edge uh, insights into the uh, into the research that's going on currently. So thank you very much for that. Certainly highlighted to me the uh, the complexity of the problem, and I think also the uh, the urgency of uh, of needing to tackle it as well. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Um, we have got questions coming through on the questions and answers. Um, there's, we've got about uh, yeah, got about 15, 20 minutes for questions. Um, so by all means, do continue to add your questions um, by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and typing them in. Um, but yeah, let's tackle some of the questions uh, that people have already posted. Um, right, really interesting one to start with, something wasn't covered in the presentation. Um, so possibly a bit of a stinker of a question, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. So are there any of the microplastics, uh, are there any microplastics that can be seen permanently in an aerosol form or seen in the air? You've covered uh, land and uh, sea there, but uh, can microplastics be in the air as well? Yes. So there are studies that are starting to be done on microplastics in the air. So atmospheric microplastics, we would call them. Um, I haven't covered this in this presentation, mainly because it's not something that I'm working on directly, but um, there have been studies, especially, um, especially within Europe, to be honest, that have shown this. So the first one that I would say was published um, was a couple of years ago, found that um, atmospheric transport of microplastics was a really significant means of transport of these particles to remote regions. So there was a study that looked in the Pyrenees, found microplastics you know, on mountains that are not very generally frequented or not very touristy um, and deduced these to be atmospherically derived and of course transported via air. These can move very long distances from urban centres and so on. So that I'd say was the first one. There are now studies going on, like for example in London there are studies looking at microplastics in air. Um, this is interesting especially because we know that vehicles can contribute to microplastics in the form of tyre wear particles. And if these particles are small enough, they can become um, you know, incorporated, transported within the air um, and then potentially lead to human inhalation as well. So these studies are happening. I'd say they're relatively new if we're thinking about microplastics in the air and how far they can travel and where they originate from is probably quite a difficult one to answer. You'd have to know a lot about the weather and the wind patterns and so on. Whether you can see these permanently, I think, is a more difficult question. And I don't know if we'd ever see, we can say we can see something permanently when it comes to microplastics, because when we do our studies, we're only looking at snapshots in time. So even if we find them every time we're analyzing it, doesn't necessarily mean they're always there, but at the same time, you know, we know that microplastics are everywhere. So I'd say it's a reasonably safe assumption that they're gonna be in the air around you. Like I'm sure they're in the air around me, in my house and you and everybody, so <laughs> yeah. No, brilliant, thank you. Um, good question and uh, very, yeah, good answer, thank you. Um, next question, um, are you aware of any research or papers around sewage sludge um, and microplastic content? Uh, also, any technology or processes which may be able to remove this? So I am aware of a research paper on sewage sludge because I've published one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so as a result of the last Uqweer study, there was a paper that I published. It was only last year, I think. Uh, and this was looking at concentrations in influent, effluent and sludge. So I can direct, um, I, can, I can send a link to that later if people are interested to read it. Um, I guess the key point is it's, it's hugely variable, but what we were seeing in sludge was enormously um, increased compared to what we saw in the influent and the effluent. So we are seeing that microplastics are concentrated within the sludge. Um, there are other studies going on. So for example, I have a PhD student at the moment who's also looking at sewage sludge application to soil and how the application of that sewage sludge can influence the microplastic concentration within the soil based on different time periods after sludge application and comparing fields that have and have not had sludge applied and so on. So again, it's, it's still a reasonably new field of research, I would say within the last five years or so. Um, but yeah, in general, I would say that there is a lot of microplastics in sludge. 
In terms of the uh, treatment options for getting rid of this, that's a really difficult question and one that I'm probably not the best place to answer because I'm not a I'm not really a wastewater engineer and I don't know how the processes work. I believe that sludge it, at the moment it undergoes lots of different tr treatments like anaerobic digestion and heat treatment and so on. The heat treatment, I mean, it, whatever the sludge has that we received as our samples, you know, the microplastics in that haven't been destroyed and that was from various different treatment works. So I would say that there's not a current treatment process that is destroying microplastics, but that's not to say that one can't be developed. Right, thank you. Um, a follow-up question on that really, um, but posted by someone else. Um, are you aware of any studies showing the amount of microplastics coming from plastic uh, sewers or geocellular tanks? So any insights into those as potential sources? <laughs> no, I actually am not aware of any. And I think that's a really interesting question is actually like, how is the infrastructure of our water treatment contributing to microplastics within those systems. So yeah, are the, are the pipes, the uh, PVC, you know, a lot of the time, are those contributing to microplastics within those systems? I'd say for wastewater, maybe it would be negligible considering the amount of microplastic that gets put into the system in the first place from our laundry, from our homes and so on. The few particles that come from those pipes might be negligible but that's just you know a statement off the top of my head so I can't say that with any certainty um as part of the same upgrade project that we did before we also looked at drinking water so again you'd potentially have those same issues with pipes and so on what we were doing was analyzing treated drinking water from the treatment plant itself so um you know is are there microplastics in that water and actually we found negligible concentrations of microplastics in treated drinking water which is great what would be the next interesting step would be to look at the water that comes out of people's taps because of course that's then gone through a whole network of these pipes that you mention and we don't know if those uh, contribute plastics or not so in, in short answer no I don't know that that study's been done but it would be really interesting to do it. Great thank you. Um slightly different tack on this one a uh, question from peter clark um combustion engines will be banned from 2030 do you think that a similar ban uh starting with single-use plastics is feasible um i mean the government are making moves towards single-use plastic bans so i think it was last year that they banned straws from being used in cafes and pubs there's a suggestion now that they're going to ban um what are they going to burn? Cutlery, I think it is, plastic cutlery in the next year or so. There are, of course, taxes on plastic bags now. So there are moves being made towards banning or taxing single-use plastics. To actually remove all those from the system, I think, would be enormously challenging because we've come to rely on them and because there are some benefits to having them. So, for example, a lot of the food manufacturers will say that actually plastics are essential because they increase the longevity of food. So plastics reduce food waste. So it becomes a bit of a balance of, you know, what's the right thing to do here? Is it to remove plastic to, to reduce plastic waste? Or is it to keep plastic to reduce food waste? <laughs> and, you know, that's a bit of a moral and ethical dilemma that I think you get into. Um, I definitely think that there are elements of plastics that could be easily banned. And, you know, like I've mentioned, straws, plastic cutlery, things that you just don't really need or that you would use once. Like if you get bananas wrapped in a plastic bag, that's completely pointless because bananas already have their own skin, something like that. But it's going to have to be, I think, a bit more nuanced than just banning plastics. And that's where it's going to get quite challenging, I think. Yeah, no, interesting. Yeah, but as you say, a bit of a moral dilemma on that one. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in terms of uh, food in plastic, I was really surprised and a bit horrified really to find out that organic uh, produce is wrapped in plastic primarily to prevent it being then coming into contact with pesticides from other food that it might be being transported to which yeah. um so yeah some interesting uh, nuances to uh, to all of that um but yeah thank you alice um interesting answer again um this one's had a few votes um so yeah people are in interested in this question um Developing countries like India and Bangladesh are seeing an increase in the popularity around constructing plastic roads in an attempt to recycle plastic waste. 
are these a cause for concern in, in increasing microplastic pollution? Yeah, this is another really difficult question, actually, because, like, to answer your question honestly, I could say yes. You know, we know that roads degrade. So if you've got a road that's made of plastic, over time you'll get potholes, bits of that road will break off and they'll go into the surrounding environment and potentially wash off into rivers and so on. On the other hand, if you don't make the plastic into the road, what's going to happen to that plastic? So, you know, there is definitely an argument for recycling plastic into new things that are potentially better, potentially upcycling, you know. So if it means that they get a road where they wouldn't have had a road and it improves quality of life, then you can't really tell them not to do that, I think. And it becomes difficult again, because we know in this country, you know, you use plastic based road marking paints. You can't say, well, let's stop using those because there's no alternative at the moment. So that's more a question of, is it good to recycle or not? <laughs> so I would say, you know, it's a good idea. Definitely. It's along the same lines as say of um, textiles made from recycled ocean plastics. You're removing plastic from the environment and turning it into something that you can use, which is excellent. But we know that those garments will shed microfibers when you put them in the wash, creating microplastic pollution. But you can't necessarily use that, that creating that garment is a bad idea because otherwise you could say, well, let, we can't recycle any plastic because then it's still plastic and it's still going to create a problem. So I think generally these kind of innovative recycling things are a good idea, but we definitely need to be aware that it's not a blanket solution to just taking things out of the environment. Yep. Yeah, as we say, complex. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a simple answer, wouldn't it? But yeah. <laughs> it really is. Um, right, hopefully we've just got time for, yeah, I've still got time for a few more questions. Um, so next one is, um, and we've obviously got some well-informed people in the, uh, in the audience today. It's reported that every person eats, drinks and breathes up to five grams of microplastics per week, uh, equal to a credit card. Um, why aren't uh, microplastics higher up the human health agenda? Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, I'd be interested to know if you've heard that figure before and if, that's, uh, <laughs> if, if that rings true with you. Or, um, and then, yeah, secondly, um, any thoughts on, uh, on why microplastics aren't higher up the, the human health agenda? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a widely reported statistic. And I mean, it's worth noting that any sort of statistic like this is uh, an estimate or it's an extrapolation of other data that's been collected. So you can't say that it is wrong or it, it's right, but, you know, it's it's a suggested figure. So let's go with it <laughs> for now. Um, I wouldn't say that microplastics are not high up the human health agenda. I would just say it's a very thorny issue and one that's very difficult to tackle from a research perspective because it's not like medical science where you can get volunteers and subject them to testing to see what happens. You know, we don't want to voluntarily subject people to things that we think are going to harm them. So if we're saying that microplastics are hazardous, which potentially they are, this is something that's very difficult to measure. So there are studies that are now going on sort of in vitro. So looking at cellular responses to microplastics and trying to then do extrapolations of, you know, if cells respond in this way, what does this mean for human health? Um, there are also comparisons that can be drawn with other industries. So for example, people that work in textile manufacturing, um, there was a study many years ago actually looking at people in flock factories. So working with very small fibers and the incidence of lung conditions and so on. So there are there is a lot of awareness of this, but I think in terms of how you measure this, it's really difficult to do so without potentially putting people at risk. <laughs> and so that yeah, that's all I can say really is that people are researching it, but it's more at a cellular level than a human, a holistic human health level at this stage. Right, thank you. Um... You touched on this in your presentation, so I don't know if you want to add more or whether you've, you've covered it already, but it, um, next question is, what are the issues linked to uh, bioaccumulation of microplastics? As I say, I think you touched on some of those towards the end of your presentation, so um, certainly uh, yeah. partly answered that at least, but anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I mean, 
It depends a lot on the organism and the particle and the size of the particle and so on. So we know that a lot of particles in, that get ingested by organisms will pass straight through the gut system and out the other side. Where bio bioaccumulation becomes an issue is if you've got these very small particles. So for example, I think less than 10 microns, but especially in the nanoscale range, these particles are small enough that they can pass through cell membranes and then into organism tissues. Once this has happened, they won't leave that tissue, essentially, unless you've got um, an organism that sheds its carapace or something, it sheds particles with it. Generally, you know, if you've got a mammal or a fish or something, any particles that end up within the tissue will stay there. Now, in terms of the issues with that, it's a foreign body, essentially, that's within your body. So any foreign body can have potentially hazardous effects. The initial thing would be inflammation. Um, so we, it would cause kind of localised cell inflammation or cell death. So we could have um, tissue necrosis, for example, but also it can lead to things, especially if we're thinking about the incorporated chemicals, things like hormonal changes, um, changing the way that the hormones are produced, changing the way in which the animal behaves. We've seen that particles can potentially transfer from across the blood uh, brain membrane as well, the blood brain barrier into the brain can then potentially have uh, behavioral effects. But again, this, area of research is still new because if we're looking at the very nano scale these are the particles that are much more difficult to work with much more difficult to handle so in terms of trying to understand what the effects of those are it's still going on and again the effects are different depending on the sensitivity of the organism itself or the particle the polymer and the additives that you're looking at yeah thank you um yeah really interesting topic um Right, I think we've just got time for a couple more questions. Um, uh, so apologies if we don't get to all of them, because we have had a lot of questions. We had over 100 people on the line um, and uh, yeah, people are clearly really engaged. So we've had a lot of questions. So if we don't get to your questions, apologies. Um, I will share them with Alice after and uh, if, uh, if possible, get answers back to you um, on the few outstanding questions we've got. But so let's just go for a, a couple more. Um, do you know what the main uh, microplastic sources are at uh, construction sites uh, and tips for site workers and managers to reduce the impact? Um, so yeah, any thoughts around that or any research around uh, sources of microplastics from construction sites? So this is an interesting question. I did touch on construction within the presentation, but actually, as far as I know, there's been almost no research on plastics within construction and their either their release to the environment or their effect on human health. So this is something that I'd be really interested to kind of know is what are the main sources? I mean, I think if we're talking about things like plastics being drilled, which is the example I think that I gave in the presentation, and I think from a health perspective, the best thing to do is to wear, you know, face coverings and stuff to prevent that from getting into the environment is more difficult. I think, you know, water sprayers and things that can prevent the kind of aerosol aerosolization of particles can help. But actually, this is a really big topic because I can't remember the exact statistic, but plastic uh, production in the EU accounts for something like, you know, 10% of plastic production is for construction materials, something like that. It's a really high right. figure. So a lot of plastic that is made yeah. is used for construction, yet nobody seems to be really thinking about that as a source. And maybe it's because plastics that are used in construction are kind of set in place. You know, they're not disposed, they're not single use, they're being used for a purpose. So they're kind of sort of in their place and they don't get, you know, released into the environment. But I guess there are those processes during the manufacture of a, a building or a construction site whereby these plastics can be released. So, yeah, that wasn't a very thorough answer, right? I, I'm aware, but yeah, I don't know much about that, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely fine. It sounds like a a big gap in the in the research and our knowledge base, really, as a as a community. So, uh, yeah, if uh, Peter, who asked that question, or anyone else knows of any research, then um, yeah, sounds like Alice would be interested to uh, to hear about that. So I'll just go for one more question. Um, so, how can plastic recycling uh, from at least households be improved? Might it help to label more clearly and find solutions for not yet recyclable material? It's a good question. I mean, I think that the key thing we need to do 
is to harmonise across the UK, whereby all councils do the same thing. <laughs> this is the thing that absolutely gets my goat, is that all councils do something that's completely different. And if you move house even from one place to another, you don't even understand what happens in, the, in your local region anymore. So I think the fact that people don't understand what to do with their waste, you know, even I have things now in my rubbish where it says widely recycled, but or check local recycling, you think, but my, my local recycling doesn't tell me about the polymer type. That's what I'm interested in. I want to know, like, what polymers can you recycle? Not like, can you recycle plastic bottles or trays? So it's not surprising to me that, like, the general consumer doesn't understand what they're doing because I find it really difficult as well. And I think that would be that would be the only thing that I could recommend that would actually work would be for councils to all do the same thing across the UK. Then those signs on the packaging, like, can be recycled and can't be recycled would make sense because it would be the same everywhere you go whereas now at the moment you go from one town to the other and can be recycled versus can't be recycled is different depending on what city you're in so yeah that's a mind-blowing thing to yeah. deal with <laughs> yeah no, I recognize all of those frustrations personally as well and I did see something just this week actually that uh, apparently co-op and Sainsbury's are um starting a new um kind of campaign to recycle soft plastics at some of their stores so one to keep an eye on and hopefully a step in the right direction um i'm going to draw it to a close then because we're we're at half past um so yeah it just leaves me to uh, to thank uh, firstly barbara for doing the uh, technology today and helping us set up the meeting and a huge thank you to alice for her time uh, to come and talk to us today and to uh, to answer that uh, those huge number of questions so thank you very much alice really good presentation um very much appreciated um and just a reminder to everyone um do check the uh, CIWEM website for uh, for future upcoming events. Um, just in just check there's no final thoughts from Barbara. Anything you need to close off? No. Great. So uh, yeah, thanks again, Alice, and thank you to everyone else who has uh, who's dialed in and listened today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Bye. Yes, thank. Thank you, um, Alice, for a really interesting talk and to. Lewis for organising it. It's been very, very good. Um, we'll get the uh, webinar up on the website as, much, as quickly as possible. So I can send you the um, Q&A report as well. Great. Thank you. See you later. That's great. Getting lots of thanks in the chat. <laughs> Are you able to um, pull off the uh, question and answers? Yes. Barbara, so... A Zoom report with the Q&A. Brilliant. Um, so I'll, I'll send those to Alice just if she hasn't got time to, because uh, there were a few, not too many, but there were a few we didn't get through. So it'd um, be nice to get responses to people if we can. That's right. No, it went well. So thanks again for organising it. And um, I look forward to the next Central Southern branch webinar. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your help as well. And we'll okay. speak again soon. Take care, Barbara. Yeah, no. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye.